Hello, everybody. Welcome to another class with Rebbe Shiva. I'm David Sedley. This is the Shmona Asrei in depth. We are up to Shiva number six, and that is the Bracha of Dat, uh, of knowledge, uh, knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to answer Sarah's question from the very beginning, go all the way back to the beginning of the Amidah, and talk about why we describe God as Hael HaGadol HaGibor Vahanora three adjectives to describe God. Uh, in the first shiur, I think I spoke, quoted the Gemara that says we may not add to those. Uh, the more you say beyond that is uh, really limiting, minimizing God because he's ineffable. So all we can say are the three phrases that Moshe said. And the question was based on this Gemara in Yuma, and the Gemara of the Yerushalmi and Brachot, which I didn't cite here because it's very similar. Uh, and it, it's coming from a verse in Nehemiah, uh, speaking about Ezra. Vayivarech Ezra et Hashem Elohim Hagadol. Ezra blessed uh, God the Great. So the Gemara wants to know what does it mean, Gadol? Why does Ezra use this word Gadol here for God? <clears throat> and uh, actually, this is also the sec same section of the Gemara that discusses why they are called Anshe Knesset Hagdola. Why are they called the men of the great assembly? What's so great about them? And as we'll see, one of the reasons they were great is because Ezra, their leader, added the word great back as a description of God. So the Gemara has, uh, I think, three other opinions about what this means, but Rav Matana says, I, uh, Hagadol. Ha El Hagadol Hagibor Vahanora, that Ezra re-established this uh, way of describing God by these three adjectives. And of course, the Ezra and the men of the Great Assembly were the ones who composed the the, the Shmon Asre, or the, the most of the prayers, but especially the Shmon Asre that we have now. Uh, so they put it back in there. What, what's so special about saying that? We all say that every day. The Gemara explains, Hadra Matana Matayla Drabi Yeshua Ben Levi. This uh, understanding of Ramatana that Ezra put the word Gadol back lines up with the opinion of Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi. Da'ama Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi. Lama Nikrashman and Sheikh Nesnagdola. Why are they called the men of the Great Assembly? Sheikh Zero Atarali Yoshna, because they returned the crown to its former glory. What does that mean? Ata Moshe Amar. Ha El Hagadol Hagibor Bahanura Moshe said in Devarim that God is great, mighty, and awesome. Ata Yirmiya, along comes Jeremiah, and he sees the destruction of the temple. Amar Goim Mikakrin Bahalo, that the Gentiles are, are crowing in our temple. Ayenorotav, how can we say that God is awesome? Uh, all powerful if he allows that to happen. So Lo Amar Nora Yirmiyahu, when he describes God, he says El Hagadol Vakibor, but he does not say the word Nora. Ata Daniel, so Yirmiyahu is the beginning of the, uh, sorry, the end of the first temple period, the beginning of the exile, and then Daniel, who is the end of the exile, the Babylonian exile. Ata Daniel Amar Goimishtab Dim Banav. Not only have they have these Gentiles uh, destroyed the temple, but they also have enslaved uh, God's children, the Israelites. How can we say that God is Gibor? As Lo Amar Gibor, Daniel, when he prayed, just said Gadol and didn't say Gibor. And then Atu uh, An Inhu, along came the men of the Great Assembly, i.e., Ezra, and and they said, "No, no, Yeremiah and Daniel, you misunderstand what it means to say that God is great and mighty and awesome." Adarabah, it's exactly the opposite. Zohi Gvurato, the fact that God allows Gentile nations to rule over the Jewish people, that shows God's strength. Because we know from Pirkei Avot, Ezu Gibora Koveshi Kitzro, who is mighty, one who overcomes his, uh, his, his desires. So God is mighty Koveshi Kitzro. God uh, conquers his own desire. According to God's attribute of justice, as soon as anybody sinned, as soon as the Gentiles sinned, they would be wiped out. God's strength is 
uh, giving them time to repent is being merciful, patient towards the wicked people, allowing them to enslave the Jewish people, uh, even though they don't deserve to do so. That itself is God's gevura. And those same things are God's awesomeness. Uh, because if it wasn't, awesome has a different meaning nowadays, but if God wasn't so uh, terrifying, right? How would the Jewish people be able to survive uh, all the suffering amongst the nations of the world? So while Ezra and the men of the Great Assembly came back and rebuilt the temple, the Gemara understands, the Gemara, Rishur ben Levi and Ratana, who lived after the destruction of the second temple, they understood that God's greatness is not only when we see him being great and mighty and awesome, when there's a temple, when there's a mishkan, when there's sacrifices, when there's a uh, direct hashkacha uh, pratit, but rather God's true strength, awesomeness and greatness is when it's much harder to see him, when, when God uh, allows nature to take its course, allows non-Jews to, to rule over us, allows, uh, uh, allows suffering and persecution of the Jews, but at the same time, the Jewish people continue to survive. And that's what uh, it means when we say that even though we've suffered and we continue to suffer and things are terrible, nevertheless, we're still around and we're still here. We're still able to praise God. And that is itself his strength and his might. So I think Sarah's question was, how does that relate nowadays to the war on October 7th and everything else? I would say even more so that this is meaningful and powerful that just when we thought before October 7th and kind of for the decade before, we more or less thought we were invincible that, uh, you know, Hamas was a pain in the, you know, pain in our thorn in our side and occasionally shoot rockets, but that we more or less had things under control and that more or less we were on top. And then uh, God allowed Hamas to do their terrible, evil wickedness um, and also allowed us, is allowing us, will allow us to survive and continue and, and that shows God's true greatness. Okay, that was going back to the beginning of the series. Now I want to go forward to the bracha of da. If there's any questions on that, feel free to write them in the chat. If I didn't answer the question, if you have different opinions, if you have other questions, throw them at me and I may or may not answer them quicker than five weeks later. Um, so we're talking about the bracha of da. Very short bracha, like most of the middle brachot. You, God, uh, grace mankind with knowledge. And you teach humanity understanding. Bestow us, grant us uh, from you knowledge, understanding, and uh, intellect. Blessed are you, God, who... Uh, bestows, grants uh, knowledge. Now, this translation is interesting, not my translation. Uh, so this is a blessing where we recognize that knowledge comes from God and we thank God or we ask God to give us knowledge. My poor son is very sunburned. Anyway, I can't sleep. I'm sorry, but you can yes, not something. sleep somewhere else because I'm giving a shit. Yes, something to put on. The uh, ask mommy. Um, so in the blessing of Knowledge is also where on Motzei Shabbat we throw in Havdalah. Now we do Havdalah twice. We do it in the Amidah and we do it again with a, a cup of wine and spices and fire. So uh, in when it's Motzei Shabbat, we throw a Tachon on Tainu Lamada to Atecha. This is Nusach Sfarad, I think, not Nusach Ashkenaz, but you. Uh, granted us with knowledge of your Torah, you taught us to do uh, your statues of your will. God distinguished between holy and profane, between light and darkness, between uh, Jew and Gentile, between the seventh day and the other day, six days of action. Again, this is not Nusach Ashkenaz, so it was a bit strange to me. Uh, Father, our Father, our King, uh, uh, grant us the coming days uh, to bless us with with peace. Chasuchim kolchet 
without any cinnamon or chemical afon, cleansed of any iniquity, and cleaving to your to the fear of you. Uh, so fundamental, well, the bracha, Gemara's going to say it in the next slide, but we include havdala in dart, in knowledge, because knowledge is being able to tell the difference between holy and profane, ben kodesh lachol. And that is holy and profane, light and dark, Jew and Gentiles, Shabbat and the other days. But it needs knowledge to tell the difference between them. Uh, so the Gemara says, uh, actually it's a machloket, but the halacha is, anyway, havdala bechon and hadat. We say havdala in the blessing of knowledge. My timer, what's the reason that we say havdala then? Amr of Yosef, mitoch shehi chokhma. Because havdala itself, distinguishing, separating between things, is wisdom. And therefore, kavu hava birkat chachma. They established, they set the blessing of Havdala in the blessing of wisdom. For Rabbanan Amre, and the rabbi said, mitoch shehi chol, because uh, uh, dat is the first of the weekday blessings, because the first three, we say whether it's Shabbat or weekday, we now get to the first weekday blessing. Therefore, lefikach kavu birkat chol, since Havdala introduces uh, the profane, the weekday, therefore, uh, therefore, uh, we put it in the first of the profane blessings. And uh, so on Shabbat, I read this wonderful idea from Rav Cook that takes this Gemara uh, of Havdalah being in Dat because it's the transition from Kedusha of Baruch HaTashem HaKel HaKadosh to Brachot of Chol. <coughs> and <coughs> Rav Cook, um, um, Rav Cook uh, spins this in a really beautiful way, and that's going to be kind of the main focus of the rest of this year. Uh, so, Amr of Ami Gedola de Ashni Nabetchia Bracha Shechol. Rav Ami says the same Gemara uh, as the previous one. How great is wisdom that it was given it as the first blessing of weekday, but the first blessing of mundane, of profane, of non-sanctified. Rav Cook uh, wrote this uh, unpublished in his lifetime, but wrote a commentary on uh, on Ein Yaakov, or at least on two volumes. Uh, Ein Yaakov is, uh, uh, takes the Agadic sections of the Talmud and puts them and writes his commentary. <clears throat> Ein Yaakov has actually several commentaries on that. Rav Cook wrote a commentary on the Agadic sections of of the Gemara, uh, printed as far as I know, we have two volumes on Brachot and two volumes on Shabbat. Uh, there may be more that they're working on, I'm not sure. So he talks about this Gemara that says that they put Havdalah in Dart because it's the beginning, the transition from holy to profane. <clears throat> so it says Rav Cook. Geder Hadda, the definition of wisdom or the idea of wisdom, is to use it in every case. Gam hashafel mishim, even the lowest use, anything, even the lowest uh, idea thing, knowledge is the tachlit hamal is to use that for a higher purpose. Vinei b'shasha adam mitasek b'malot v'nyanei kedusha. Uh, when a person is involved in, in high spiritual things and concepts of purity, even if he's not a great intellect, that's easy for him to, to use those things for their purpose, because those are holy things. But when he's involved in non-holy things and mundane things, that's when you need the appropriate level of wisdom to uh, to second them, to use them for the uh, ultimate purpose. Uh, like we see in Pirkei Avot, a wise person knows the future, meaning anything uh, to be wise, to, to have dart when you're sitting and learning in yeshiva, learning in kolo, learning Talmud all day long, that's easy. To have dart when you are working in a gas station, when you are serving in the army, when you are studying in university, that's when you need ultimate uh, de'a. Of course, this uh, lines up with Rav Cook's big concept that uh, Zionism, secular Zionism, paves the way for 
religious Zionism and, and uh, the, the uh, messianic vision, and that the ultimate goal is to take the, uh, the secular and to make it holy. So Ralph Cook says the ultimate wisdom is to know how to use the secular and make it holy. This concept of taking everything and using it for holy purposes is the meaning of the verse, <clears throat> um, in all your paths you should know him. Meaning, not only when you're learning Torah, but everything that you do. Shamar Zer Bar Kapara, uh, Bar Kapara said about this phrase, Bechod Rechecha De'ehu, Shi Parshak Tana, Shekol Kufei Torah Tloim Ba. This is a small verse that all the principles of the Torah are dependent upon this. V'zeo Bechlal Kol Masecha Yud L'Shem Shemayim, and this is also the meaning of all your actions should be for the sake of heaven. Rambam writes about this in Shemona Prakim, his introduction to Pirkei Avot, which is not really an introduction to Pirkei Avot. Says, uh, this idea of all your actions being for God is a wonderful statement. That the greatest philosophers have written books on this, but still don't fully understand it. So Rav Cook says that Dart is to use the profane. Therefore, at the beginning of the mundane blessings, the weekday blessings, when we leave Shabbat or when we leave the Kedusha of the first three blessings and start thinking about our own lives and our own needs and our own wants, we leave holiness, that's when that's when we must start with dart, with knowledge, and praying for knowledge. Because then even the mundane things will become holy. Now I just I just love this idea of Rav Cook. I had not heard it before in this context. And I think it's absolutely wonderful that um in every in every way, but Rav Cook is saying whatever you're doing, if you think about it and do it in the right way, then you're serving God. And ultimately that's our goal. Right? Not to live solely in a world of holiness, but to interact with the mundane world and make that into a holiness. And that's all through dart, through knowledge. So I'm so in love with this idea that I threw out all the other ideas I had for this class. And basically, most of what I'm going to say for the next uh, 40 minutes is going to be connected to this idea of uh, of knowledge being a conduit to holiness, of of, of sanctifying the mundane. Let's look at Rambam, what Rambam actually says that Rav Cook is quoting. The very beginning of chapter five of his eight chapters, Shemona Prakim, Rambam says, Tzarich l'adam shi'abid kochot nafsho kulam lefi haddat. A person must uh, um, subjugate all of his uh, abilities or strengths according to his knowledge. Like I've explained in the previous chapter. He should always have before his eyes one goal. Which is understanding, attaining God. As, as, as much as your ability. I mean to know God. To, to make all of your actions, your movements, your resting, everything you do, brings you to this purpose of knowing God. So that none of your actions are uh, uh, pointless, are, uh, are unnecessary. Meaning none of your actions will not lead to the ultimate knowledge of God. Um, so dart for Rambam, is to know that everything you do, if you need to sleep, if you just sleep because you're tired, that's a waste. If you sleep because you know that by sleeping you'll serve God better when you wake up, that's making that sleep into something holy. If you, uh, well, especially for Rambam, if you learn science because you want to learn science, that's a wasted opportunity. If you learn science because that will lead you to know God, then that's sanctifying the whole, sanctifying the mundane. Um, so let's examine that idea a bit further. The Gemara and Brachot talks about the greatness of knowledge and doesn't particularly go down this idea of obviously didn't, doesn't quote Rav Kook who lived many hundreds of years later. 
but uh, clearly knowledge is something very important. Amr of Ami. That knowledge is very so great because it was given between two of God's names. Shenema it says, Ki el deot Hashem. God is a knowing God, a knowledge God. Uh, so Hel and Hashem are two names of God, and knowledge is in between, and therefore, uh, therefore, that shows the greatness of knowledge. Anybody who does not have knowledge, it's forbidden to be merciful to him. For they are not an understanding people, and therefore uh, their, their creator will not have mercy on them. Uh, again, Rav Cook says about this, that if you don't have the knowledge to understand uh, sacred and profane, then you won't understand and appreciate the mercy either. There is no point in in if I if I take if I just buy a treat for my kids, they don't appreciate it in the same way as if I make them work for that treat or explain to them why it's a treat or how much it costs or how much effort went into it. If they don't have the knowledge to understand what's happening, then it's valueless to them. Uh, so the same way, if somebody doesn't have knowledge to understand that they're receiving mercy, it's forbidden to give them mercy because they'll think that's just, well, that's the way things work and they won't understand right from wrong. And we'll get into the concept of morality soon. Same Gemara. The temple is also great because it was also given between two names of God. Uh, the work of God is the temple of God. And based on that, the fact that both Dat and Mikdash are given between two names of God, any person who has knowledge, it's as if the temple was rebuilt in his days, because knowledge was given between two of God's names, and the temple is given between two of God names, God's names. Now, when I learned this Gemara, I thought, oh, that's cute. But now with Rav Cook, I say, oh, because it's the dart that makes the Mikdash. That when I have dart and everything I do is to serve God and to sanctify the profane, then everything is a Mikdash. So it is, it is literally as if the temple has been rebuilt in my, in my days, because everything I do is, way, is a way of serving God. Knowledge. Uh, and Havdalah, right? We do, we say a bracha over fire at Havdalah, which is in the blessing of knowledge, and knowledge and fire are connected. Uh, so let's back up a step. Go back to creation. The Gemara Chagiga says, Amama Rav Zutra This is the very beginning of the section that gets all Kabbalistic and, and weird. Um, so I don't understand this, but I can read, me read the words to you. So Rav Zutra Bar Tuvia Amar Rav said in the name of Rav. The world was created with 10 things, I don't know, 10 attributes, maybe 10 somethings. The first three, Chochma, Tfuna, Dat. The first three are wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And then Koach, Gara, Gvura, Tzedek, Mishpat, Ches, uh, which somehow connect to the 10 Sfirot. I'm definitely not going to go down that road now, but the three founding principles of creation are Chochma, Bina, and Dat. Uh, that's where Chabad takes their name from. Chabad is an acronym of Chochma, Bina, Dat, uh, not from the Gemara specifically, but from the top three Sfirot, uh, which precede the, the, the lower Sfirot, which are entwined with creation. Um, and then it brings the verse, We know that God created the world with wisdom and understanding because it says God founded the earth with wisdom and set the heavens with understanding. And with knowledge, because the verse says with his knowledge, the uh, depths were dug, founded, broken, whatever. Now, the Gemara Psachim is bothered because it says that uh, fire, light and dark were created on day uh, on day one of creation. 
Uh, why is that in day two? Um, no, sorry, I'm, I'm confused. Um, on Friday, yeah, this translation is peculiar. Uh, God wanted to create fire on Friday when he created Adam and Eve, um, and then he didn't until Motzei Shabbat. The Gemara earlier says that the first fire is the spiritual fire of Gehenna, and the second fire is the physical fire of uh, that we use. So, uh, so the Gemara says already done. The fire that we're talking about, uh, or our fire, Machshava. This translation is completely off. Um, maybe I anyway, fine. Machshava Allah libra be'er Shabbat. God thought to create fire on on Friday. But he didn't create it until Motzei Shabbat. Titania Rabbi Yossi says that there were two things that God thought to create on Friday. But he didn't create it until Motzei Shabbat. thought to create on Friday. But he didn't create it until Motzei Shabbat. And they were not created until after Shabbat. But Motzei Shabbat not to Hanukkah Kodesh Baruch Hu. Day Abba Adam Harishon. Because on Motzei Shabbat is when God gave knowledge to Adam. Ma'ain duk Masha Mala. Similar to the knowledge, to the, the heavenly knowledge. Ve'vishnei avanim, and Adam brought two rocks. Utachanam zobazo, and he struck them, ground them together. Ve'atzah mehen or, and fire came out of them. Ve'vishtei behemod v'kibbez, I don't want to go into the animals. Um, but, uh, so the Gemara here connects knowledge, uh, connects having knowledge with the secret of fire. That, that, Adam, well, well, we'll get back to the text in a minute of Genesis, but when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they had the knowledge with which they were able to create fire. Had they remained in the Garden of Eden, had they not been kicked out after Shabbat, they wouldn't have needed fire because they wouldn't have needed to cook food. They wouldn't have needed to heat, warm themselves. Fire is now, all the purposes that fire serves would have been unnecessary had they remained in the Garden of Eden. But once they had the knowledge to understand there's a wider world out there and we don't want to stay in the Garden of Eden or can't stay in the Garden of Eden, then that same knowledge allows them to create fire, which then protects them from danger, warms them, cooks for them, uh, signals, all the things that you need for fire. I don't know, I've put the same slide twice and just confused myself completely. Uh, so this idea of knowledge and fire Reminds me of the Greek legend of Prometheus, um, who stole fire from the gods and gave it to mankind. And his punishment, of course, was to uh, to be chained to a rock. And every day, an eagle comes and tears out his liver, and then every night it grows back. Um, so he gave fire to the world, but also his name Prometheus means forethought, and he's also credited with giving technology and knowledge. And everything that makes civilization to the world, um, and in some versions, he even is is the creator of humanity. So, even in the Greek story, and I'm just showing this as a parallel, not to draw any conclusions, but both in the Greek story of Prometheus, the fire giver is the is the one who founds, who gives intelligence and science that leads to civilization. And similarly, in the Genesis story, which we see here, uh, it is. It is the knowledge after eating from the tree of knowledge. That's mm -hmm. when mankind gets fire and is able to start creating, start inve investigating and discovering things that make science and things that build society and civilization. Uh, so uh, the text says in Breshit, God put, took the man, he put him in the Garden of Eden to, to work and to guard it. No need for fire there. And God commanded man, saying, The first mitzvah, eat the fruit, eat. But from the tree of good and knowledge, don't eat me menu. Because on the day you eat from it, you'll become mortal. And in becoming mortal, you're then, with that knowledge, that means you need to have, you're allowed to have fire and everything that goes with that. So, uh, so, fundamentally, knowledge is a curse, although, well, the world in the way that we have it, we wouldn't be in the world if it wasn't for the sin of Adam and Eve. If there was no knowledge, 
I can't even say what the world would be like, but it would be something entirely different. The world as we have it, the world, the civilization that we live in is built on the knowledge that came from Adam and Eve eating the tree. And that knowledge then to sanctify the profane, to take the fire or take two rocks rather, uh, and, the, and turn them into fire, which is the fuel of society and civilization. Um, and, and that's again, this message of Ruff Cook and, um, and I was going to say something, but I've gone completely blank. So I will just move on to the next idea. Um, oh, that's right. And Motzei Shabbat. That's why we light a candle on Motzei Shabbat, uh, because that's when, right? We don't use a candle on a fest after a festival if it's a different day of the week. When we say Havdalah, only on Motzei Shabbat and Motzei Yom Kippur, because that's called Shabbat Shabbaton. Uh, so on Motzei Shabbat, that's when fire was uh, was given to the world. And that's why we light a candle then. Um, but that's when the world, that's when we'd be able to work with the world, we're able to interact with the world, we're able to use that fire uh, to build and create everything that we need. Knowledge is not only a knowledge of civilization and taming you know, the wild world, uh, it's also a knowledge of morality. And here, Rav Hertz, Chief Rabbi Hertz, uh, says something very profound. The first of the petitions is for knowledge and spiritual insight. Throughout scripture, wisdom is regarded as essential to moral living. And we pray to the fount of wisdom that we grow in true understanding, so as better to fulfill the duties of our lot and station. The knowledge especially referred to is the knowledge of the good that enables us to avoid evil and gives us the power to do righteous things. In other words, the knowledge of Adam and Eve is the knowledge of morality, is the knowledge to know what's good, what's evil, and to do good and to avoid evil. Uh, and without knowledge, we can't have morality and we don't know the difference between right and wrong. Um, we, the, the most, the wisest of all men, or at least one of the wisest, King Solomon, asked for knowledge and why did he ask for knowledge? So, Vayom this is the beginning of the Book of Kings in the, right before the dedication of the, right before he builds the temple. Vayom Shlomo says, uh, God, God appears, verse 5, God appears to Shlomo in a dream and says, you've done good, boyo. What would you like as a gift? What shall I give you? And Shlomo says, Ata asita im avdecha David avi chesed gadol. God, you've done kindness to my father David. Because he walked before you in truth, righteousness, and uprightness. And you, you, uh, you proved or you uh, uh, kept, I guess, this kindness, this kindness. And you've given my father a son sitting on the throne like today. So the reason God was kind to David was because David knew the difference between right and wrong. Now God, you've made me the king. In place of my father. But I'm young. I don't even know if I'm coming or going. Your servant is in the midst of the people who you chose. I'm a mighty people. You can't count them. They're infinite. Please, can you give me a heart to listen? To judge your people. To understand the difference between good and evil. Because how else can I judge your people without the knowledge to distinguish between good and evil? So Shlomo asks for knowledge because he's asking for morality. He's asking to be able to judge the nation tell them what's right and what's wrong. Uh, Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, says the same idea. God says a wise man should not be proud of his wisdom. A strong man should not be proud of his might. A rich man should not be proud of his richness. 
because the only thing that's truly praiseworthy, praiseworthy to uh, in, incline your intellect and to know me because i'm god i do kindness and justice and uh and and, and law uh, in the land that's what i want be wise be smart to know me and to know the difference between right and wrong so that's ultimately what it means to have knowledge and that's the separation between Kodesh Lecho. Uh, Rambam, Guide for the Perplexed, the last chapter of the last section of Guide for the Perplexed. He says the term Chochmah in Hebrew is used in four different ways. It denotes the knowledge of those truths which lead to the knowledge of God, meaning where shall wisdom be found? Or if you seek it like silver. The word occurs frequently in this sense. So, um, well, we'll see a bit later on. For Rambam, Dat means to know God. The, the dart that we want to have, the dart that we pray for. The expression Chochmah denotes also knowledge of any workmanship. For example, right when they build the Mishkan, it says Kochacham Lev, all, every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. And all the women that were wise hearted did spin the wool into the Mishkan. So Chacham can be a skilled craftsperson. It's also used of the acquisition of moral principles, meaning teach a senator's wisdom with the ancient as wisdom. For it is chiefly disposition for acquiring moral principles that is developed by old age alone. So, w- without wisdom, you can't have mor- morality, but even with wisdom, you need morality plus old age. And then he has a fourth meaning, which we don't want. It implies, lastly, the notion of cunning and subtlety. For example, come, let us deal wisely with them, um, which is what Paro says to his advisors when deciding to commit genocide against the Jewish people. In the same sense, the term is used in the following passages. It says, and fetch thence a wise woman. Uh, That's when Shaul is uh, looking to speak to Shmuel, who's now dead. He goes to a witch. They are wise to do evil in Jeremiah. It is possible that the Hebrew Chochmah expresses the idea of cunning and planning, which may serve in one case as a means of acquiring intellectual perfection or good moral principles, but may in another case produce skill and workmanship or even be employed in establishing bad opinions and principles. The attribute Chacham is therefore given to a person that possesses great intellectual faculties or good moral principles or skill in art, but also to persons cunning in evil deeds and principles. So Rambam says that Chachma itself uh, can be either Kodesh or Chol, that, that Chachma is uh, wisdom or skill or morality, but it can also be evil and cunning and uh, subtlety in that sense so uh so therefore rambam says according to this explanation a person that has a true knowledge of the whole law is called wise in a double sense he is wise because the law instructs him in the highest truths and secondly because it teaches him good morals but as the truths contained in the law are taught by a tradition not by philosophical method the knowledge of the law and the acquisition of true wisdom are treated in the books of the prophets and in the words of our sages as two different things Real wisdom demonstrates by proof those truths which scripture teaches us by way of tradition. Meaning, if you believe in God because that's your tradition, you're not really cutting it. Believe in God because intellectually it makes sense, because you've delved into it, because you've used your uh, your insight and your wisdom to understand what that means. That's what the goal is. And we'll come back to this idea, time permitting. Um, so it is this kind of wisdom which proves the truth of the law that scripture refers to and extols wisdom and speaks of the high value of this perfection of the consequent paucity of the men able capable of acquiring it in saying like these not many are wise but where shall wisdom be found right so we don't ask god and the amida for wisdom to be able to learn gomorrah better we ask god for wisdom to be able to know god better which can come through any number of ways. And and the, the more tradition and the more uh, knowledge of religion you have, the easier it is to get there. But if you miss this last stage of knowing God, then you're missing the whole point, says Rambam. In the writings of our sages, we notice likewise many passages in which distinction is made between knowledge of the law and wisdom. They say of Moses, our teacher, that he was father in the knowledge of law, in wisdom, and in prophecy. 
So somebody can know the whole Torah and still not have wisdom. And yet that's the first thing we ask for when we begin. We finish the first three blessings, which are praise of God, and start asking God for things. We ask for wisdom because without wisdom, everything else is meaningless and pointless. We won't appreciate anything else. We won't be able to know how to use it. We won't know how to sanctify all the gifts that God gives us to use them to serve God and to know God. Uh, I guess there's a slight move sideways, but I think it's also very important in the concept of knowledge that uh, knowledge, the kind of knowledge we're talking about is not the knowledge of an ivory tower where you lock yourself up in a room and you just sit and contemplate and study and, and don't interact with people. The, the God's ultimate knowledge is expressed in, uh, in his understanding of people. And so knowledge for us also is to understand people. The Gemara Brachot talks about this bracha, which we very rarely say. Um, yeah. Tana Rabbanan, Hare Ochnusei Yisrael. If you see, uh, and the original version of this, um, the original writer of this does not say the word Yisrael. It just says if you see a large gathering, which we no, it happens to be 600,000. A large gathering of people, but now in the Gemara and Brachos became 600,000 Jews. If you see there, or may you say, Baruch Chacham Harazim. Blessed is God, who is wise, who knows the secrets. Right? This is Chachma, to know the secrets. Shein Datam Because their minds, their, their intellects are not the same as each other. Their faces are not the same. Meaning, Every single person is different. You can look at the outside, they look different, but also on the inside, they think differently. They understand differently. They, their concept of morality is different. Uh, and if we treat everybody as the same, if we just sit, sit and think in the abstract, we're missing the whole point of trying to be like God and understand other people. Ben Zoma, Ra'a Uchlusa al Gavmala Habaharabayat. Ben Zoma, who I'd like to suggest uh, on the next slide, two slides, uh, is. Ben Zoma is one of Rabbi Akiva's students who, who went with him into the Pardes, one of the four who entered the Pardes. And uh, Rabbi Akiva came out unscathed. Acher became a heretic. Uh, um, ben, I'm blank on the fourth one. Somebody died. And Ben Zoma went crazy. So I wonder if this is uh, after he went crazy or a precursor to it. Ben Zoma Rauch Lusal Gav Mala Baharbat. He was sitting uh, on the, uh, he, he lived after the temple was destroyed, but he was sitting on the Temple Mount and he saw 600,000 people. Amai said, Baruch Hacham Harazim, blessed is God who knows the secrets, or Baruch Shebarakol El Shamsheni, and blessed is God who created all these people to serve me. What do you mean to serve me? This, the whole, everybody is there to serve him? Hu'eyomer, what does that mean? Ben Zoma would say, How much effort did Adam Harishon have to put in until he found had bread to eat? Harash had to plow the ground. Zarai had to plant the seeds. Katsari had to harvest the seeds. Emiri had to bundle the, the grain. Dash had to thresh. Zarai had to winnow. Barai had to select. Tachani had to grind it. Hirkit had to sift it. Lash had to knead it. Va'afan then bake it. Va'chakach achal. And then he could eat all that work that Adam Harishon had to do. I wake up in the morning and there's a loaf of bread in the shop waiting for me. How much effort did Adam Harishon have to put in in order to have clothes to wear? Gazaz, Liben, Nipetz, Tava. He had to shear the sheep. He had to bleach the thing, the, the wool. He had to spin the wool. He had to. Uh, to uh, no, there's two phrases of spinning. Uh, to weave it. Only then did he have clothes. I wake up in the morning and I've got clothes waiting for me. Because, uh, because all of these 600,000 people are all serving me. And nowadays, we see this even more so. I want some clothes. I put an order on the internet and someone in China makes something and ships it to Taiwan, who then sends it to somewhere else and it comes to me from the other side of the world having touched dozens of people in dozens of countries. Um, so I, I can only appreciate that 
if I understand how much effort went into that. Uh, all the nations, uh, meaning everybody comes to my doorstep and brings me the, the things I need. I wake up and I've got everything in the world I need. So Ben Zoma is not insulting when he says all these people are serving me, but rather he's appreciating uh, the effort that goes into it from everybody in the world. There was some a comedian, I can't remember his name, made a TV show where he wanted to thank everybody who was involved in making his cup of coffee. He goes to Starbucks and buys a coffee and they start tracing back to the guy who grows the beans, the guy, uh, whatever, uh, brews the beans and the guy, all the, he wanted to thank everybody. It's amazing how interconnected we are when we talk about knowledge leading to fire, which leads to civilization. We are so interconnected through that civilization and through that knowledge. So that appreciation, I think, is a really profound thought. And, and that's why knowledge can't be just in the abstract. We can't go into an ivory tower and sit and try and contemplate God without understanding all the people who go into that system as well. Um, so this is the Gemara Chagiga after Ben Zoma has gone crazy uh, and uh, the Gemara is discussing how crazy he is. So I wonder if this is the same time that he's standing on Harabayat. Tana Rabbanan, my said Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya, Shah Omed al Gav Male Baharabayat. Once Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya, that's Rabbi Yeshua, was standing on the Temple Mount. Virahu ben Zoma, and Ben Zoma saw him. Uh, Rabbi Yeshua is Rabbi Akiva's teacher, Rabbi Akiva is Ben Zoma's teacher, so Ben Zoma has to stand up out of respect for Rabbi Yeshua. But he didn't stand up before him. So, Ben Zoma, Ben Zoma, what's going on? Why, why did you not stand up for me? Where have you been? Like, where, where's your mind? Ben Zoma says, I was contemplating the upper waters and the lower waters, right, in creation. Uh, on the second day, God separates the two waters. And the gap between the upper waters and the lower waters is only three finger breaths. The Spirit of God, hiv, Spirit of God hovered over the water. Like a pigeon, like a dove, says Ben Zoma, like a dove that hovers over its children and doesn't touch them. And that's three finger breaths. Amalehen, Rabbi Shula Tamidav, Rabbi Shula says to his students, I die in Ben Zoma Bechutz. Ben Zoma is still on the outside. He still hasn't got it. If that's what he's using his intellect for, to try and figure out these abstract theoretical, well, I'm making this reading. It's another way of reading it too. But if he's uh, involved in such, in, in such uh, theoretical pursuits that he doesn't know how to interact with me when I come, he doesn't stand up before me, then, then he's missing the whole point. Now, there is another reason that Rabbi Shua disagrees. It's not three finger breaths that it's, they're really just touching. And there's, but, but I like my vision better, at least for the purpose of this year. So the ultimate knowledge that we pray for three times a day, that we ask God for, that we kick off our prayers for, the knowledge that we want and that we need is the knowledge that leads us to understand God or to know God. Um, and, and Rambam, so I quoted Shemona Prakim before. I'm coming back to it a bit further on the same chapter. What he says in the preceding uh, paragraph is that learning Torah is, it, it's easy to see how learning Torah can lead you closer to God. But more than that, uh, other ways that you can reach this goal of knowing God. There's no question. Things which don't uh, um, uh, don't obviously or intuitively lead to understanding God, like mathematics, Sefa Charutim, the study of conic sections, okay, Vatach Bulot, mechanics, Laharbot, Mishalot, Andasa, other questions, Andasa, uh, um, engineering, right, Umashichar, Mishkalim, uh, weights, Laharbek, Yotibela, all these secular subjects, all of this kind of knowledge doesn't obviously lead you to God. So what should you do? Should you study that or not? But, the goal here should be to sharpen your intellect. 
and to uh, make use of your mind to to yeah. use your brain. But darchei ha'mofet ad shi'akir l'adam kinyan yediat hekesh ra'mofti mezulato, so that you can then come to understand uh, logic and knowledge of other things. And then this will lead you to the knowledge of the truth of God. So again, Rambam says, if you're learning maths, math, because you want mathematics, because you want to know how to count or add or whatever you do with mathematics, that's a waste. What you should do with mathematics is learn mathematics so that you can sharpen your brain so that ultimately you can come to know God. And that's as Rav Cook said, at the beginning. That's taking something secular and making it into something holy. Now, this is a big idea, a big principle with Rambam, the very beginning of Mishnah Torah, chapter two of Yisari Torah. <clears throat> chapter one, he says that the, the main mitzvahs are to, uh, the main mitzvahs to know there is a God, and then chapter two, he says the mitzvahs to love and fear God. Hakel hanechbad hazeh, this mighty, wonderful God, mitzvah lahavo, Torah is a mitzvah to love, God and to fear God. after you should love the Lord your God. and you should fear the Lord your God. Says Rambam, But how do you love God? How do you fear God? Right now, in certain yeshivot, they will say, learn more Torah, learn more Talmud. But Rambam doesn't say that. Rambam says, when a person starts, uh, understands uh, and contemplates God's uh, actions and his cre wonderful creations, and he sees God's infinite wisdom, meaning when you start studying, uh, I don't know, science, you start study cosmology, astronomy, you study biology and microbiology, and you see the infinite detail, the infinite wisdom, the infinite interconnect interconnectedness of everything that God created. You're immediately filled with love and praise and glorifying and a desire to know the God, a great desire to know God. Like David HaMelech said, My soul thirsts for God. For Rambam, the way to love God is to study the world, to study science. And when you continue thinking about the wonders of science, the wonders of nature, immediately you're seized, uh, jump backwards, and you're afraid. You know that you're a small, uh, uh, meaningless, trivial creature. Uh, with just such a small, uh, trivial knowledge, compared to God's, you know, perfect, perfect knowledge. David, like David said, ki When I see your uh, your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that we should mention him? Now Rambam says, since love and fear of God both come from studying the natural world, the, the natural world and the unnatural world, what Aristotle would have called physics and metaphysics. So therefore, since you need to know science to understand God, I'm going to explain to you, I Rambam in my Halakha book, I'm going to explain to you how, how the world works. Um, to give you an opening, a chance to understand how to come to love God. Uh, like the rabbi said about the loving God, through love you come to recognize he who said, let the world come into being. Um, and then Rambam uh, spends the next two chapters giving us Aristotelian physics and metaphysics, uh, which nowadays is outdated, which leads to all sorts of strange things that don't match up with our current science. But what Rambam means is not that the uh, Ryako Kamenetsky writes this in Emes Lyakov. Rambam isn't saying that, I mean, he thought Aristotelian physics was accurate and correct and was all there was. He didn't envisage that would ever change. But I don't think he's saying it's halacha that you have to believe in Aristotle, but rather that 
it's halakha that you've got to understand science in order to understand God, in order to come to love and fear God. And it's even worth taking chapters three and four of his magnum opus of halakha, uh, taking time out to begin with science so that you can love God and so that everything else makes sense. So for Rambam, that da, da, that knowledge that we ask for is a knowledge to understand the world, which leads us to understand God. I want to finish with uh, two pieces from Moran Nevochim, Guide for the Perplexed. Uh, it begins, this is an introduction, but it begins, it's addressed, the whole of Guide for the Perplexed is addressed to Joseph ben, Yosef ben Yehuda, uh, who is a student, came to study with Rambam, he left confused, Rambam wrote him a book that will help him with his perplexity. As I've said last previously, since Rambam wrote this in Arabic, I'm just going to do the English rather than the Hebrew. So the, again, this is the beginning of uh, of the guide, and he's explaining why he wrote it, for whom he wrote it, and what qualities a person needs to be able to get the most out of the guide for the perplexed. My dear pupil, ever since you resolved to come from me from a distant country and to study under my direction, I thought highly of your thirst for knowledge and your fondness for speculative pursuits, which found expression in your poems. I refer to the time when I received your writings in prose and verse from Alexandria. I was not then yet able to test your powers of apprehension. I thought that your desire might possibly exceed your capacity. But when you had gone with me through a course of astronomy, after having completed the other elementary sciences studies which are indispensable for the understanding of that science, I was still more gratified by the acuteness and quickness of your apprehension. My Rambam is praising, is writing Morin Evochim for a, a student who is whose knowledge leads him to a knowledge of mathematics and science. Uh, and that's what he's praising him for. Uh, so observing your great fondness for mathematics, I let you study them more deeply. For I felt sure of your ultimate success. Afterwards, when I took you through a course of logic, I found that my great expectations of you were confirmed and I considered you fit to receive from me an exposition of the esoteric ideas contained in the prophetic books, that you might understand them as they are understood by men of culture. Imagine you had a time machine and you could go back in time and sit with Rambam and learn anything you want with Rambam. Rambam would say, let's start with math and astronomy, because without that, you're not going to get to the deep secrets of Torah. Maybe everyone else can get by with the, the, the basics, but to really understand it, you've got to learn the natural word, the science first. That's knowledge for Rambam. I think that's an amazing idea. And now he ends. I already showed you the very end where he talks about what Chochmah is. Um, but just before that, and that was 54, 51, he says, the present chapter does not contain any additional material that has not been treated in the previous chapters of this treatise. I've run out of time. Anyway, it's, I've got one slide to go. No, I don't, but I'll just pretend I do. It is a kind of conclusion. Uh, uh, explain in the, what men are those, those worship God who have obtained a true knowledge concerning God? How do you come to know God? So he talks about a parable of the king and his palace and people are facing the wrong direction, going the wrong way and different levels of further away and back and whatever. So there's some people who don't know anything at all. Some people are going in the wrong direction. Some people get to the palace. Uh, that's the religious people, but they don't really see where the king is. They don't know God because uh, they're religious, but they're ignorant. Uh, and there's some in the palace who are going the wrong way because they're too busy with their religion and not using their brains to look for Argue, for logical arguments. Um, he says, those who succeed in finding a proof for everything that can be proved, who have a true knowledge of God, so far as a true knowledge can be attained, and are near the truth, wherever an approach to the truth is possible, they have reached the goal in a place in which the king lives. So when we pray for knowledge, we're praying to come to know God. Um, and, and, and Rambam says, natural philosophy, metaphysics, uh, mathematics, science, logic, that's how you come to know God. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, if you've got time to look at my website, rabbisedley.com, I'd appreciate any feedback, feedback you have. And I'll see you next week when we will do uh, the next bracha. Thanks very much. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for taking your time and effort and giving me an answer. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm sorry it took so long, but it was a good question and I hope a good enough answer. Thank you. All right. Good night. Bye.